Good morning, everybody. On behalf of Dr. Ashok Gulati, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Amar and Professor Pingali for inviting him. And I have to apologize that he could not make it. And me and Stuti are two persons working in his team, and we're representing his presentation here. And uh, I hope to be able to do justice to the work he's already done for us, and we'll be sharing it with all of you here. So, um, presentation. Um, the theme largely is that we'll be talking about three things on Indian farms. I'll start with land holding, how the changes have happened over the years. Next, I'll look at labor market, how the changes have happened there in terms of the number of labor, labor workers we have and how their wages have changed. Third, I'd look at the level of mechanization on Indian farms at the moment. We look at synergizing and interaction between these three variables. And I'll end the presentation by highlighting some challenges that the Indian farms face today and some of the solutions that are in the pipeline already and which we fish to propose. So to begin with, very clearly, and uh, that's well uh, established, our, no our average land holding size has been falling. We were 2.28 hectares in 1970-71 and 1.15 now. But in terms of land, uh, the number of land holdings, we've increased from 70 million to about 138 million today. It's important to see this graph. This basically talks about what we say swelling of the bottom line in case of India. We have four bigger headings where we define our land holdings, marginal, small, semi-medium, and medium and large. So by marginal, I mean less than one hectare. Small and medium will be one to two hectares. Small will be one to two hectares. Semi-medium is two to four. And then going forward is medium to large. In 1970, 71, 70% of our land holdings were small and marginal. Today, they are 85%. Close to 95%, we are less than four hectares. So this is how we are saying that the bottom line has been swelling. Close to 55 million land holdings got added in the, margin in the last category. About 11 million in the small category. The picture completes when we look at the operated area. So 138 number of land holdings operating on 160 million hectares of land. In 40 years, the operated area has fallen by 2.9 million hectares. The area operated by the 85% of our small and marginal farmers has swollen up from 21% to 44% today. So the small and marginal farmer who has land less than two hectares is operating on 44% of our operated land. So I'm just consolidating the two things. So between the 40 years, you can see the number of operational holdings increasing and the share of marginal and small swelling up. In case of operated area, while the total operated area has gone down, the share of small and medium and marginal has gone up. But interestingly, while we do have a reduced uh, number of operated areas, but we have a higher GCA. And this graph shows you exactly that. The interaction is between the total operated area, the net cropped area, and the gross cropped area. From 162, the operated area has gone down, gone up, gone down to one, 160. But in terms of gross cropped area, we've actually increased it from 165 to 197. Excuse me. Sir. Uh, I think uh, from my, pro my own experience, yes, sir. Uh, India has a unique way of measuring land in the world, <coughs> gross cropped area and net cropped area. Yes, sir. So please explain to the audience what, what, what difference there is. Of what course. What is net of? Of course. So if I may start with the total operated area. Now, total operated area will actually include fellow lands and forestry also, apart from land, which has uh, gro crops grown in them. Gross cropped area will be area on which one or two or more crops have actually grown in a financial year. Net cropped area will only so be counted once, one crop. An area twice. It'll be it's a GCA. Two hectares. Yes. So net cropped area, 
Yeah. yeah. It's counter Please explain. Okay. So, so that is how we define the cropping intensity. So net crop... For the ties in this room, I recommend strongly that our statistical system make a distinction between gross cropped area and net cropped area. We only have gross cropped areas. But our understanding of the productivity of land is very strongly affected. We always say that our yield is very low because we don't look at net cropped areas. So, uh, so having that advantage here, we do look at net cropped area. So by comparing the gross cropped area and the net crop area, we deduce that about 39% is the cropping intensity. That means 39% of the land is where double cropping happens in India. Now the question arises, why has this fragmentation really happened over the years? We've really seen the land holding size reduce. And the biggest reason is the land laws. And amongst the land laws, two big things that come out are the land ceilings and the tenancy. Now when we gained independence, after that, the objective was to eliminate a zamindari system. Now zamindari system gave rights exclusively to large landholders and everybody else was tenants working as bonded laborers under them. So on the premise of ensuring greater efficiency and equity in the system in the second five-year plan. So uh, we have a planning commission. We used to have a planning commission in India before that has been replaced by a Niti Aayog. Now planning commission it's just called by a different name. It's just called by a No, but then a lot of functions have also been diluted less there. Powerful. Yeah, lesser powerful. So uh, the planning, so earlier till about, uh, we currently have, we have five-year plans which give direction to all the policies that will be executed within the next five years, and they are proposed at the onset. Now, five-year plans define the strategy which will be implemented in a country. So now, the currently, we are undergoing our 12th five-year plan, and after that, we would not have any five-year plans going forward. So this policy of, implement of removing tenancy and adding land ceilings was introduced in the second five-year plan. Now, I am presenting to you here a table that talks about, as on date, what kind of land ceilings do we have? Now, land ceilings are defined in terms of the quality of the land. If you are an irrigated land, and let me give you an example there, India today has 54% of its gross cropped area irrigated through rains. So 46% is under assured irrigation. So 54% is rain fed. Now, if you have an irrigated land and you're serving two crops, your land ceiling will be the second column. Then you have an irrigated land with one crop. The land ceiling will be the second column. And then if you're a dry land, the ceiling increases for you. So on an average, in case of India, we have about 6.5 hectares. And this, this is an average number, very rudimentary calculated from the state numbers that I've had. 6.5 hectares of irrigated land with two crops will be the ceiling, beyond which the government owns the right to take away the surplus and redistribute it. Second, 10.3 hectares of irrigated land with one crop and about 18 to 26 in case your land is dry. Next thing is tenancy. It's, it's, it's interesting. So uh, the policy basically said that they wanted to abolish or restrict tenancy. How did they do it? They said that there is a ceiling beyond which it will get redistributed. Now the ceiling resulted in two big, three big problems rather. One. The landowners who did not want to undertake agricultural activities let the land be fallow. They did not uh, use it towards agriculture activities. Now, beca because they did not want to and they feared losing the ownership in case they actually lent it to other farmers or to agricultural laborers. Second, because they were restricted to their land, their mobility of uh, mobility of labor was restricted. So even if they wanted to diversify their labor and income by going into non-farm sector, they could not, fearing that their ownership could actually get diluted in case they got away from their land physically. Third thing, 
even the person who was tilling the land in terms of tenant lost out one there was no formal contract as in date there is no formal contract when they actually have ceilings because uh, because they lose there are a lot of states like kerala for example kerala totally bans tenancy then there are states like up uh, bihar and madhya pradesh where they say that we will lease land only to disabled people or to widowed women or to whip or to people who are in the army nobody else is legally allowed to lease land then there are states like up like punjab like haryana who say that if your land has been with a tenant beyond a stipulated time you lose your ownership because of all this there are no formal contracts so because of this the the person who's been regularly tilling it one he doesn't have a contract therefore he does not get input access access to subsidies which he otherwise should have actually gotten from the government second he doesn't have an incentive to invest in his farm because he knows beyond a point he'll be shifted to another piece of land so that's the problem we're facing at the moment so that kind of explains why we still have fellow lands continuing and which are getting shrunk because of the population pressure so we are about 1.25 billion at the moment third thing why fragmentation's been happening is non farm sectors not been able to absorb not been able to absorb people out of agriculture <coughs> i bring this to you why because uh, and uh, i take it up from professor jikun's uh, presentation small may not be beautiful necessarily here the example is two extreme states punjab and kerala and i say extreme extreme in terms of their land holding sizes at the moment punjab and haryana are the states which have the highest land holding size average land holding size at the moment 3.8 hectares kerala is on the other spectrum with a 0.22 but if we looked at the grass gross value of output per hectares in 11 12 terms and that's given in the right hand side small box there kerala has produced about 126000 of gvo per hectares whereas punjab is 76000 this explains the value of output that they are generating or the basket of goods that they are producing so that basically means if you're producing high value agriculture like spices horticulture you no so this just gives you an example this just gives you an example that small may not be bad also it's it's a different game so that way is you'll have to diversify your production basket away from maybe a cereal or a this standard is, uh, crop earnings up those so per holding so this is value of output value of output holding yes sir gross value gross so it's not, not in per hectare so this is per hectares okay yes sir So uh, while I clearly uh, uh, we know it now that the land holding size has been falling now the question arises about the people who are working on that land and uh, I would want to present some numbers from census of india um, ag me. i want to leave the, the question yes, hanging in the air what's the point what's the point of having per hectare why not per person So because family sizes differ. Yeah. So you can leave that hanging. Yeah, I leave that hanging. No, sure. Why? Why Come is? Why? Yeah. Why and is? Why right is then. land so sacred that you want to maximize per hectare yield? I agree. Sure, sir. So I could okay. So. Uh, going on so as i said land holding size has been shrinking but if we look at the number of people who are working on the same land so we start by looking at agri workers at the moment now there are two sources of finding out what the number of agri workers in india are at a point in time one is census of india that repeats after every 10 years the other one is nsso that's the national sample survey organization that does survey every 5 years so the bigger problem between identifying what source to use where is basically when I, when we wanted to see how much of involvement at the national level of agricultural workers was census gave us the split but nsso which i'll be showing in the eventual slide tells us industry wise split of the laborers also so let me run through first this slide that says our population by tw and because it's every 10 years you can see the columns that says 91 2001 and 2011 so the population's gone up for from 846 million to about 1.2 billion 
total workers have gone up from 314 million to 482 million. Now, the workers, if we look at rural and urban split, is basically 72 and 27.3. So while 72% of our workers live in rural areas, 68% of our people live in rural areas. So population sp split at the moment is 68-32, while the workers split is 72-27. Now, if we look at agricultural workers, census gives us a number of 263 million people in agriculture in 2011 as, of, as, a as total workers. So as a percentage of total workers, it's about 55%. Now, if we look at cultivators and agricultural laborers, let me give you a definition there as to how we define cultivators, is basically if you own land. And that is where the difference between NSSOA and census will be. Here, ownership of land is important, but under NSSO, you could not, even if you're not an owner, you will still be counted as a farmer in case you had a right to decide what to produce and when to cut. So here, as a percentage of total agricultural workers, 45% are cultivators. 55% are agri-laborers. So two points here. One, as a percentage of total workforce, cultivators are about 25%. As you can see, the second point, cultivators have gone down and agri-laborers have gone up. So cultivators have actually gone down. That means ownership of land is diluting, and the number of agri-laborers operating on the land has been going up. Let me look at the employment-wise sectoral split here. Now, this data is from NSSO. What this says is, from about 60% of the total employment in 2000, Agricultural employments come down to 49%. So in case of India, we use two numbers. And that's, that's what we say. As NSSO, we have about 49% of our workforce employed in agriculture. As per census, it's about 55%. So these are the numbers which do float in the market. And that's the number we've actually been using. Estimated also, we've deduced it from these surveys. Uh, the, does the data have seasonal fluctuations? In in the numbers sorry sir it's I, only one shot a year a, so a it's year. just so every 10 years in census nsso is every five years nsso well, within one year there's only one just one yeah just one once. yeah I mean, the the difference <coughs> between the numbers i showed yesterday and these ones this one basically aggregates everybody working in the agriculture sector it doesn't <laughs> differentiate between people who say Agriculture is the main occupation versus the secondary occupation. I this is where I think the problem is coming. You know, actually, okay. I. But uh, we can talk about this later. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Done, 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 done. done. Okay. Let's let's so finish up and then we come back to this yeah. discussion. Sure. Done. Uh, so this is a slide that reiterates what I've really said already, but it runs you through the years, comparing that from 69.7 percent of total workers who were agricultural workers in 51, we are about 55 percent now. Now the question arises about wages, and uh, we've undertaken, uh, we've collected these wages. So first, these are farm wages. These are of agricultural laborers. And the thing I will want to draw home from this slide will be that the agricultural labor today is becoming expensive. And that's the point I'm trying to draw home from this. I will tell you how I've calculated this. These numbers are calculated from the Labor Bureau, and we get different activity-wise uh, the daily wage rate for these agricultural laborers. We estimated for 20 bigger agricultural commodity, uh, agricultural states, which looked at 93% of country's workforce. We estimated their individual state-wise monthly wages. We weighted average it up for calculating it for the national level. And these are the numbers that we've done. So there are two curves. One is nominal and one is real. We deduced real by using CPIALs, the Consumer Price Index for Agricultural Laborers, and the data is on 2004 and 5. And it clearly shows that there was a structural break in 2006 and 7. 
2006 and 7 was that time when we really saw a sudden jump in the year-on-year -year increase in the Indian farm wages. Now, what explained this high farm wages? There are two, three things which are really important and need mention here, and I will want to be quoting uh, Dr. Gulati's CSCP paper there, where he's econometrically tested from years 1995 to 12, 13, what the factors were driving the farm wage growth rate. First biggest reason he found out was the growth in the construction sector, which pulled out these, far, these, these agricultural laborers, shrinking the supply of agricultural laborers, and thus pushing up the wage rate. Second was Manrega. Manrega it wasn't an important factor, but it did play a role. And I will just initiate what this Manrega is. Manrega is an acronym that stands for National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. The scheme started in 2005, was implemented across India by 2008, but the scheme assured unskilled manual labor employment for at least 100 days in every financial year to whosoever who applied for it. If you did not get that employment within 15 days of application, you were entitled to an um, allowance, unemployment allowance. Now, what Manrega did was, even if there are a lo lot of impact assessment studies claiming that Manrega, and MG in front of Narega stands for Mahatma Gandhi's, so it was re-Christianed later years, so it's a rural uh, Employment Guarantee Act. Now, what Manrega did was, one, it gave an alternate opportunity, job opportunity to the agricultural laborers, and plus it increased the base or baseline of the wages, that minimum wages that these agricultural laborers got. Third, why these wages got up was that the commodities, the commodities were selling at better remunerative prices. And so there was an increase in the cost with a lag eventually going to the labor. And I will just show you. So sorry, I missed one point. There was this point where we, we talk about growth in agriculture, which catapulted the, the, uh, the, the, the performance in agriculture, and therefore the relative incentives going to agriculture were growing. And uh, this basically shows you, plan-wise, what an average growth rate of India was and how it compared with agricultural growth rate. In 11th plan, we, we, we had an average growth rate of 4.1 for five years between 7 and 12. In the 12th plan, 14, 15, 2014 and 2015 were bad drought years, consecutive drought years for India, and that's when we had a crash in our agricultural performance. And the average growth rate that's come out for, for the five years is about 1.7. For the current financial year, 16-17, the first advance estimate says that we'll have a growth rate of about 4.1% this year in agriculture. If I next look at relative price incentives, which were improving for Indian agriculture, we can see that how the index has been going up, and particularly since the 2008 and 9 crisis, which again, uh, which made a lot of our agriculture commodities globally very competitive because global prices were rising, it actually pushed up the entire relative price index. So there were two things. One, the global food price index making some of our commodities competitive, and there was a ban simultaneously, so we could not really harness a lot of opportunities. And second was the national food security mission that started during the same time in India. And part of that mission was that the MSP, the procurement of pulses and cereals, had to be uh, aggressively promoted for the upcoming five years. So on an average, about 20 to 22 percent of MSP increase was witnessed in rice and wheat in the two years between 7, 8, 8, 9. And that's how the relative price incentives for agriculture has been going up. Now, this is where I bring together the mechanization. So uh, I have four graphs here. So one is the real wage index, which has been going up, and that represents the costs which are due for the farmers. Second is the relative price index, which I'm trying to show that the farmers are getting compensated on the revenue side because of higher relative index. And then is the tractor sales and the long-term credit index. Now, tractor sales is the red line with the rectangles. Now, that has witnessed a sharp increase. And I will show you how the tractor density looks at the moment in the eventual slides. But at the moment, what I'm trying to draw home is 
that the long-term credit policy on the support side, which, by the way, actually supported, which majority of this long-term investment was into tractor purchase, supported the tractor purchase, and therefore the tractor sales have been going up. So on the revenue side, you had greater relative price incentives. There was rising wage, which was causing you to substitute your labor with greater mechanization wherever possible. And there was a long-term credit policy where, which gave that thrust to the increasing mechanization in the country. At the moment, we have about 5 million tractors. And it's, it's, it's a number we've deduced from the Tractors Association, and I still not vouch for uh, the accuracy of the number, but that represents fairly the number of tractors at the moment. In terms of density of tractors, there are about 26 tractors per 1,000 hectares of GCA, gross crop area, in the moment. So in terms of, in terms of um, operational holdings, 40 to 45% of our operational holdings use tractors today. And then is the tractor sales and the tiller sales, which have actually gone up in the years. And uh, this is an important slide where we see how public and private investments in agriculture have actually changed forms. In 1980-81, private sector's share in total investments in agriculture was 54%. Today, it's 85%. So as total capital formation as a percentage of agri-GDP has gone up from about 10 to 22 percent. So it's largely private sector, largely investments into mechanization that has been happening. Now what explains this increase in mechanization, and I'm bringing together the facts that have already laid here, one is the rising private investment in agriculture. Second, rising real wages, which is causing you to shift away from labor and hoping to substitute mechanization wherever possible. But there are problems there also, and I will talk about it. Remunerative improvement, because you've had greater, better prices in the recent years. Fourth, greater access to institutional credit. Uh, so, you venture a guess as to the causation between number one and number two. So, so uh, <laughs> sure. So, clearly the challenges, and I'm coming down to the end of my presentation here, the challenges that the Indian farmers are facing today is clearly rising input costs with labor becoming expensive, land becoming scarce. Average land holding size has been falling, and there is greater marginalization of the Indian farmer today. And there's a number we've calculated, and that says that number of people tilling the same land has actually doubled in these 40 years. Nabard says, and Nabard is a rural bank, that says every five to six years, India is adding 10 million farmers. Farming real income growth rates have actually been very slow. In terms of now uh, farmer income, uh, we've calculated a number. In 2002 and 3, farmer earned about $44 per month, one farmer. Now, in 1213, the number is equivalent to $118 per month. There are states which have actually witnessed negative real growth rate of farmer's income also, like Bihar, as Professor Pingali had mentioned yesterday, and West Bengal. Last is, and amongst the many is, that farming is becoming financially unfeasible. It's non-inclusive of small and marginal farmers, and it's environmentally unsustainable. And uh, I can uh, detail why we've used these uh, names if, if there are questions uh, raised. So the way forward, yes. Sir. Uh, finish. I think, I think finish? I no, no, I want to make sure. sure sir. You are saying that agricultural laborers have their wages increasing. Yes, sir. Farmers, on the other hand, suffer. Let me that farmers excluding agricultural labor. True. And there are two classes. And yeah. absolutely. And the two are the two the two are really separate. And it's no, I will tell you. So I will tell you, sir, so the way NSSO, because the number the income of a farmer is calculated from NSSO survey. And NSSO survey says 
farmers are of two types. One, clearly you have a land right of ownership. Second, even if you do not have a land right ownership, if you have a right to decide what is getting produced at a point in time, you will be counted towards this. Uh, you're a tenant now, whatever. Sure. So, uh, so now what we're trying to say is all over India, between the 10 years of between 2002, 3 and 12, 13, real farmer income growth rates have gone up by 3.5% per annum. Nominal, they've gone up about 11.7%. But then, within this, there are states who've actually witnessed a much higher growth rate and a much lower growth rate. So Bihar and West Bengal emerge as those two states where in these 10 years, the income growth rate of farmers in real terms is actually negative. But in other states, it's highly Oh, absolutely. So let's talk about that, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I was just clarifying what it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think we need to really wrap this up quickly. Sorry, yeah, yeah I'll just do that. So um, the way forward is clearly that we need to reform our land policies. And uh, tenancy and ceilings is one bigger policy change that we are envisaging. So the earlier planning commission and now the Niti Aayog has come out with a model act of land reforms in 2016. The act says that you will protect the ownership right and it will facilitate creation of formal contracts so that there is greater formal tenancy that is happening at the moment. So that is already underway, but then it's again at a proposed stage, and we wish that is something that will give the thrust to consolidation of land holdings, which we seek in the coming times. Next way forward and will that be is union government policy. Union governments. So agriculture is a state subject. So union government proposes, and there are three states who have come up and said they'll be uh, happy to implement it. And and but again, it's at a nascent stage. All of these states customize, as you had seen in terms of land ceilings. Also, the range varies, and therefore even here. And then we need an improved access to inputs like machinery and to extension services. And uh, because machinery was one of the main objectives, I'm going to show you three examples after this slide where we are innovating in terms of how to deliver machinery to a very small and a marginal farmer. And I will show you that. So in case of machinery, clearly, there, these are very small farmers and bigger investments in machinery is over capitalization. So what we need is machinery for higher model. So clearly, the model we're looking at is like an Uber tractor. And this is happening in India already. I give you three examples. One is EM3 Agri Services, where what they're doing is they own the machinery, and then you can just call them up and hire it, and they deliver it for different crop stages. And that's what they've been doing. Next model is, again, you facilitate your ownership. So what government is subsidizing is it is helping you procure these larger, invest uh, larger machinery. It subsidizes that capital investment, and they let you sublet it to farmers. And he facilitates, the government facilitates the process. This is a central government scheme where the state governments have been adding to the extent of subsidization, which is finally getting delivered to the farmers. And then is this farm mart. Now, farm mart model says even if farm mart in itself as a platform, technology platform, does not own machinery, it connects the people who own it and have it, uh, and they have it idle in times to people who would want it. So that's like a technology platform where you're just connecting and sharing. You may not need to own it. And I, I think I, I will just end here, and that's all. So thank you.